socially distanced world, Design United is an optimistic digital platform for collaborative design and connection. Design United was created in March 2020 during a period of intense lockdown and quarantine measures within the region. The aim behind Design United was to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young regional designers and design practices. A much needed network of support and peer mentorship during these uncertain times. Talented young designers and design studios working on design innovation with an approach that is relevant to our South Asian region have been invited to be a part of the platform. We also encourage design students from the region to share their work, be involved in the dialogue, and to be an active part of Design United. Design United, most of all, believes in creating a community of designers and design knowledge that is largely contextual with focus on contributing to the environment and our community. Design United believes greatly in a spirit of collaboration and idea exchange. Good evening. Welcome to Design United's 26th Design Conversation, a very special conversation. Mentorship and constructive criticism is essential to nourish designers. Design United's exciting mentorship series today is with two inspirational designers and mentors sharing their experiences and their design journey. We will be in conversation with architects Brinda Somaya and her daughter, architect Nandini Somaya Sampath, joining us from Mumbai, made possible by, by the valuable support of architect Parul from SNK. I'm Varna Shashidhar, founder principal of a regional landscape practice, VSLA, based in Bengaluru. I'm supported by my wonderful DU and VSLA team in this endeavor, along with Playwork Spaces. Clayworks creates flexible co-work spaces that focus on productivity and sustainability. Clayworks has now come up with a complete work from home solution. The aim behind Design United is to create an optimistic space for regional dialogue, connections, collaborations, and opportunities for young designers and design practices, a much needed network of support and mentorship during these uncertain times. Design Conversation has featured talented and emerging designers from our region, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, selected for their innovative approaches and practices that have a deep resonance with the place they are from. We've also had brilliant mentors and regional designers with great expertise and commitment to mentoring younger generation of designers. So please do continue to join us every Saturday at the same time, 4.30, for the conversation. With this background to Design United, let's move to the much anticipated presentation and conversation this evening. I'm truly honored to welcome the inspiring presenting designers this evening architect Brinda Somaya and her daughter, architect Nandini Somaya Sampad. Their presentation will be followed by a moderated discussion. It's indeed a privilege to introduce our presenting designers, renowned architect and urban conservationist, Brinda Somaya, who's truly inspirational. She started her firm Somaya and Kalapa Consultants in 1978 in Mumbai, and for over four decades has merged architecture conservation, social equity in projects ranging from institutional campuses, rehabilitation of earthquake-torn uh, villages, to restoration work, demonstrating that progress and history need not be at odds. Her work spans large corporate industrial institutional campuses, extends to public spaces. Master planning and building design of multiple corporate and educational campuses, which have has become her area of expertise. Some of the award-winning campuses include Tata Consultancy Services, Nalanda School, 
Zenzar Technologies. Her firm has also recently won the competition for the restoration and upgradation of the historic Louis Kahn building of the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. Educated at Smith College, Massachusetts and the University of Mumbai in arts and architecture, architect Brinda has received numerous distinctions in her career in architecture, including the 2014 Babu Rao Matre Gold Medal for Lifetime Achievement awarded by the Indian Institute of Architects. Also an honorary doctorate from her alma mater, Smith College. In January 2017, she became a member of the Council of Architecture Committee to review the profession and education of architecture in India and joined the board of the Lafarge Holcim Foundation for Sustainable Construction, Zurich, Switzerland. She's also been elected as the A.D. White Professor at Large 2017 by Cornell University. She is on the advisory of the International Archives of Women in Architecture, U.S. And she's the founder trustee of the Hekar Foundation, which has brought out several publications on heritage and architecture. She's also chaired a conference and a seminal exhibition with her daughter Nandini on the women, work of women architects with a focus on South Asia in Mumbai earlier this year, along with a brilliant three-day conference. On a personal note, architect Brinda and architect Nandini with their conference have inspired me, and I'm sure they've inspired many more emerging women designers like me. The conference and exhibition were extremely beneficial personally for me uh, the idea of manifesto making uh, put forward by uh, the exhibition helped me in understanding and positioning my approach towards my practice. Also, therefore, in starting Design United as a connective platform for emerging regional designers. The Women in Design Conference was absolutely refreshing, one of the best I've attended. So it's such an honor to welcome the distinguished and inspiring architect Brinda Sumaya to Design Conversation. I'm also extremely privileged to introduce and welcome architect Nandini Somaya Sampal, who is a lawyer by training with degrees in political science and law. She decided to pursue her interest in design through her studies in interior design at Inchpal School of Design, London, and architecture at the Rizvi College of Architecture, Mumbai. Nandini takes the legacy of SNK forward. As director at SNK, Nandini is involved in all aspects of design, coordination, and execution of projects. She continues to work closely with her mother, architect Brinda Somaya, to ensure the continuity of the integrity and high quality of design and services the firm is known for. She is spearheading various SNK collaborations internationally. She believes in developing expertise and bringing global standards of design practice to India. The inclusion of local Indian arts and crafts into contemporary works is an, another important aspect that Nandini continues to support and encourage within the firm. Continuing of public, community and pro bono projects remains a high priority for architect Nandini as it was when architect Brinda Somaya started the practice. She is also the editor of the wonderful monograph on architect Brinda Somaya, Works and Continuities. A insightful monograph on architect Brinda and their prolific practice. It's such an honor to welcome both architects Brinda and Nandini to Design Conversation. Welcome. And we request you to please share your design journey with us. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Varna, for such <laughs> a glowing uh, description of both of us. We, we um, feel truly privileged to be part of this afternoon with you and Design United. I'd like to congratulate you and your team and all the young people connected with this on, on this work that you're doing during this, these difficult times, actually. And uh, so when you uh, approached us, you know, both Nandini and I have been in lockdown, as you can imagine, for the last seven months. We've been giving uh, several webinars and lectures. And when you talk to us, you know, we thought Saturday afternoon, 4.30, do people really want to see another presentation of our work? They can go to our website or they probably, some of them may have even seen it before. So what can we do that's different? So we thought that we're not going to just um, 
you know, show project after project after project, which seems like we've had our fill of it over these last many months. And maybe we just have a fun conversation. I, I will begin talking a little bit about uh, my background. Some of you may know it, but some may not. So I'll run through that quickly. And then Nandini is going to take over and, and just share how we work together. Now, I know there are many uh, studios that have more than one uh, person heading it or one partner. Um, uh, it could be friends, it could be people from college, it could be father and son, or it could be um, husband and wife. But I think mother and daughter combinations are far and few between, at least that's what I've been told. And so there's a uniqueness in this. For me, it's been absolutely wonderful to have Nandini with me. And I thought it might be fun to share uh, some of our personal journeys together rather than, as I mentioned earlier, just projects. So um, Nandini, can we begin? We can share the screen. So I just want to uh, talk about a few slides. I began my practice uh, in 1978, oh, more than four decades ago. And uh, it's been a long journey. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time just talking about that. But it was, um, my father was a power engineer. My mother was a zoologist. And those days, travel was not going to Hong Kong or Singapore, or Dubai or America. Travel was within this great, wonderful, majestic country of ours. And uh, my parents took us from north to south, east to west. We used to drive through the roads and through Dakot infested central India. So this is a picture of me. I'm in the middle. Uh, I must have been about six, seven years old. But I remember being taken to the, to the monasteries and the historic Buddhist center of Nalanda University. And if they talk about one thing, one impression that made you decide about your life or the road ahead. Perhaps this was one because this image was always in my subconscious. Uh, it made me want to first become an archaeologist, finally led me to architecture. And uh, subsequently, I even designed uh, through the studio SNK, uh, a wonderful school in Madodara called Nalanda, which we did with brick and brick vaulting. So it was a special moment for me, which I'm sharing. And then, of course, to, uh, later on, I joined the, I, we moved to Mumbai and I joined the Sir JJ College of Architecture, which was at that time one of the few and premier institutions. There were not that many colleges in India. Today we have over 500. And there were very few women, as you can see with the picture on the top left. We were about nine girls with about 60 or 70 in our class. And of course, we were all huddled together in the first row, and a few of us were in the second. So there were not many backbenchers and girls. We were all, I think, quite studious in, in some ways. And the lower picture is when we graduated. So when I graduated in 1971, you can see how skewed uh, the gender ratio was. I went to the United States. There I am. Um, I did not feel that my education was complete. I always believed that an architect's role is, goes way beyond buildings. Uh, it's a guardian of the built and the unbuilt environment. We are the conscience of all that. So I felt those days especially, which luckily now apparently is being changed, that we never learned anything around art, uh, sociology, photography, history, geography, uh, you know, the subjects were so narrow in so many ways. And I did this uh, a master's course, a master's course in arts uh, at Smith College uh, with some design work at Cornell, which was a wonderful opening of new avenues, new thoughts and experiences for me. And I think that very strongly shaped uh, the practice in the years to come. So after I came back uh, from the US, um, at that time in the 70s, very few people came back, but it's another long story, which we don't have time for. When I did come back to India, I decided I did not want to be peripheral to society, which I would have been if I'd stayed on there for sure. 
I, I felt committed and uh, I started my practice in the first picture to the left, which was an old Mali's shed, which was near my house. It was a tiny little room with a big mori, which you all know, a mori in the middle. So we could have just two desks and then we had this big dip in the middle, which finally we sort of put some boarding over so we wouldn't fall into that. And it worked well because it was very close to my house. And uh, in 1978, my sister, who's also an architect, came uh, back from the U.S., joined me for two years, but then subsequently went back to Europe in 1980. So it was just a two-year interlude. And in 1980, I was left uh, a young woman all by myself and wondering what to do. Uh, by then, I had got married. I had had two children. My husband is a surgeon, cardiac surgeon. First was in the army moving around, but then subsequently we settled down in Mumbai. And that's when uh, SNK really began to grow. So the pictures to the right on sides, the picture to the right bottom I've chosen because it uh, was a project we did in the erstwhile Soviet Union in 1990. The 1980 to 1990 was a very lonely time. There were very few women who were heading their own practices. Uh, so it was quite an isolated time. But looking back, it was probably the best thing that happened to me because I had no interruptions. I could concentrate on what was important, which was really my work. And building up a portfolio of work, of built projects, which we all know is what's really what we architects are about. And that's what then eventually led to the practice growing uh, over time. So the bottom right is uh, a hotel, which we worked in as a consortium. And even though this picture shows me in 1990 with a lot of men around, there were women. For the first time, I saw women structural engineers, women mechanical engineers, because Russian women were very much working in the engineering and architectural fields. So I think uh, it was not lonely working on that project. The, the hotel came up, it's in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. And it, it did show me that uh, apart from the United States, uh, there were other parts of the world where women did play an important role um, in our profession. So there's SNK, it's multidisciplinary. Uh, we, have, uh, we have one office based in Mumbai. Uh, right in the heart of the historic center of Mumbai and Ballard Estate. And we do all types of different work, which Nandini might talk about a little further as we move on. We have architects uh, um, and uh, conservation architects. Uh, we have graphic designers, engineers, landscape. We, we believe that architecture is something which cannot be worked in in isolation. It is a very collaborative process. And uh, that's what the brainstorming is all about. But before I started my practice in 1975, I have to share this picture with you because I worked just for six months in an office. And of course, I was the only woman. And it was like a punishment. There I am drafting those days with the T square and the set squares, my handbag over there. And my boss, my boss at that time, was somebody midway in the whole studio, was sitting next to me, I could not turn right or left. Even if I had to go to the washroom, I had to get permission. And I spent six months, uh, I'm not saying it's not important, uh, but doing uh, just toilets and staircases. But it taught me a good lesson, the importance of both, but also made me absolutely sure that this is not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I needed to do what I believed in and what I had to uh, and for that, I had to uh, find my own path, so to say, and work on my own journey through the profession. Then, of course, uh, uh, we built it up and it was wonderful when almost 14, 15 years ago, Nandini joined me. Her story, of course, you've heard a bit, but it was wonderful because it brought in a, a whole different uh, aspect to the studio apart from usefulness, technology, different ideas. Um, by then, I, I am a senior citizen now. And today, of course, many of most of our uh, architects, we have about 60 plus people in the studios. 
65 people or so are much younger. So of course, it was very, very important that, uh, that new ideas, new thoughts, and I love to learn. Uh, I'm currently, as you know, in lockdown. I've moved to my farmhouse and uh, I'm learning a new language. And I'd also given up driving because I thought automatic cars were very difficult and I only drove geared cars. But the last one month I've been here at the farm, I started driving again on automatic cars. So learning is something which uh, I love and which I will, uh, I hope I can do as long as uh, possible. So at the same time, we have certain design principles and I'll just run through very fast. Uh, there are walls, light, geometry. What, what is a concept? You know, people ask, what is your style? s and has no style. We, be we believe in building appropriately for which we have design principles. And these are as follows. Um, these are some project uh, photographs of our work with our design principles, the role of water that has played in all our projects, very, very important in a country like ours. The role of light. Nothing can be more wonderful and beautiful than our Indian light, but how we harness it, how we use it, how we create shadows, how we create shade, that is so, so important. So how do we do that? So these four photographs show how we bring in light in very different ways in our different projects, depending on their location, the function, the purpose of the building and the users. Walls, we all love walls of different materials. Uh, these, the upper one is a church with a very small budget. So the wall, the wall of the church itself became the cross. And then, of course, the different projects that uh, come through with, with walls of different shapes and sizes, defining space, containing space, enlarging space, leading you on to different spaces. Walls can be wonderful and mysterious. Geometry. Uh, this I don't need to elaborate. It's the fundamental aspect, I believe, very, very important part of architecture. And uh, I don't need to say more. But whether it's restoration of the Lajobite Tower, which you see in the middle, or whether it's a very, very modern campus at the Goa Institute of Management, geometry always plays a very large role uh, in our work. And then, of course, materials. We believe that we have everything in our country that we can use. So whether it's stone or whether it's brick, whether it's plaster or whether it's metal, uh, we can work with all those sensitively not by building glass boxes, but by understanding how material works with the climate, why it's important, and how do we use it more effectively. So over these 40 years, uh, the studio believes in five C's. They are community, the role of us, SNK, within our community, within the city, com contemporary work, our cultural projects, and most important, collaborations. We are not stars. We have to collaborate with each other. We have to work with each other. That's what architecture is all about. So over uh, the 40 years, we've done uh, every possible type of the five Cs, which I mentioned. We've done, uh, we started counting the projects only because of the book. Till then, we had never even bothered to count. So we've done uh, built, built and completed uh, over 200 projects. And some are big, some are medium sized, some are large. But uh, except for one small one, which I recently heard was broken down by a developer, every other one is standing. And I think that's, that's very, very uh, heartening for our studio. So but while we were doing all this, uh, another very important thing came to play for us, that what is the role of us uh, with women particularly, and but more than that as well. So that's when a group of us, and I was the founder um, trustee of the Hekar Foundation. It's an acronym for Heritage, Education, Conservation, Architecture, and Restoration. So we began by, we have over the years brought out several books but one of the most important things we have done is we have actually chaired and created 
uh, and held two very, very important conferences. Uh, both have long stories for which we don't have time today. One uh, Barna has talked a little bit about, but it actually began first with women in architecture, which we did in 2000. We brought out the book, you can see it in the upper left corner. And that uh, was for the women of South Asia who had never been invited to India. Uh, we celebrated women's work. We did not moan and groan. We created partnerships and many of them talk about that even today. So 20 years later, since uh, nothing, uh, no big conference was held in between and everyone kept asking me to do something and I kept saying no, but now with Nandini's help, I said, why not? So this year we did a Women in Design, which was an international conference. And I think uh, uh, you've already heard about this. We will also be uh, bringing out a website dedicated to women in design. We hope all of you will enjoy it. Uh, Nandini will tell you more about it because the younger people in the studio are handling what's going to be in that. So it's the Hekar has been very, very important for us. We have supported um, reconstruction of villages. We've supported women uh, architects who want to do their master's degree in different parts of India. And uh, we have also um, want to have many thoughts and ideas as we move ahead, building, our, building up an archives uh, and other things. And we hope that we will work and collaborate with people like uh, Design United because we can't work in silos. We all have to work together. We don't need to create, you know, start with the wheel each time. And this is the exhibition we had, uh, which was very, very special. Uh, we had such a great turnout, but most of all, we had lots of fun at this conference. And the speakers were remarkable. We had the most amazing and famous women from around the world who immediately said yes. And uh, it was such a great opportunity for, I think we had almost 700 people uh, who attended the conference. And uh, okay, so now I'm handing uh, it over to Nandini. So as Mrs. Samaya said, uh, we thought we would uh, talk about a very different aspect of our studio today. Uh, instead of uh, purely showing our work, we thought we would share with you all uh, how we've worked and how I've had the opportunity to work with my mother over the last uh, 15 years. So uh, we call it the story of us, and we looked forward to sharing it with you all today. Live, love, and learn. I think these are the three main things um, that I have been blessed uh, to have learned growing up in my lifetime and in my profession. And it's probably the three things on which SNK has been built and continues to grow on. Um, if many people ask why I changed professions and if it's the one thing I learned from my parents is that these three aspects need to be prevalent and very present in your life both in the way you live and in the way you work. So this is a picture um, dating back uh, uh, many many decades. Uh, I am there in the middle uh, holding my mother's bag, my mom on, on the right of me and um, ironically, we're standing in um, the most beautiful house my, my mother had built uh, for, for a company. Um, in the background, you see my grandfather, who was a very important presence for both uh, my mother and myself. Um, he really believed and made us believe that women were capable of doing anything and everything. And uh, I... I do uh, believe that today we are where we are uh, because of, of his beliefs. And I started helping out my mother at that very young age and started carrying her bag. Even today, as we are on site, I continue to do so. So I think we were destined uh, to be together on this journey right from the start. Travel, um, very important part of my growing up as it was my mother's. Uh, she shared with you the picture of Nalanda and I, I think the gift that her parents gave her to travel across India, she gave to me and my brother. 
and this of course uh, was in Rajasthan and we would go to uh, different places and see every historic part of the city that there was. My mother would often lead the way and three of us, my father, myself and my brother would be tagging a few steps behind as my excitement would always be uh, much higher than the rest of us. But that certainly rubbed off uh, over years and years of learning about places. And I think one of the most important things it did for us is to learn about our country and to learn to love and appreciate and value its history and what we have. And without that, without really knowing and traveling to different parts of it, that really cannot be appreciated. So this is another image of that. Like um, her, I too graduated uh, from the same college, Smith College, but I did my undergraduate there. Um, I did my bachelor's in political science. And as she mentioned, it did the same thing for me. It was such a wide gamut of learning. Um, we were able to do quantum physics, art history, um, uh, mime, archery. Um, I was on the rowing team for many years. It gave me the opportunity to work on Capitol Hill. I was one of the first international interns to ever work on Capitol Hill. And I still recall I used to give uh, tours of the Capitol Hill building and I had to tell them the history about Washington, D.C. And maybe that was the start of it all, that there was a natural uh, a kind of pull towards buildings, history, city and design. So Smith College and education uh, for us, I think we have great value and we're greatly indebted that we were able to do to get that exposure uh, uh, to see and understand the world more and in such a uh, encompassing way. The picture that she shared with you uh, earlier is her in, in Russia, she showed. And this is, of course, me in the office, which was taken uh, by another staff member who very surreptitiously walks around and clicks these photos when my mom and I are not looking. And when we put them together, I thought, gosh, uh, it seems to be sometimes the same, but also very different. Uh, as she said, um, uh, this is all our SNK team as we work together. But today, of course, there are so many women involved now. And uh, the gender balance is almost turning today, especially in architecture schools when we see it. But yet our profession is still wanting uh, for women in senior positions in the profession. And uh, we still have to help lift each other up and give each other the confidence uh, to pursue those goals and to pursue what we feel we can do independently. So that is incredibly important. And uh, all of us, I believe, must support each other to make sure we can help each other get there. Uh, I think this is 1991 on the left. I think as designers, we find ourselves in these positions a lot where we are we have to ponder, we have to look and think about the world. And this, in 1991, there were no mobile phones. So my excuse on the right, I'm typing away while I'm waiting on a site. And my mother has to think of the world and, and you know, use her imagination, which is of such high value. Sometimes we forget that. But I think it's, it's capturing two moments uh, that we both experience while we work at two different times. Uh, but almost the same type of emotion running through uh, the journey that we're both experiencing. So, um, of course, uh, uh, those times where you get to contemplate and think, and at this time of COVID, uh, many of us have had that opportunity. Those are important times to think of the plan ahead. And of course, as we know, during the completion of projects, there are many, many long hours that you have to be on site uh, while doing this. Uh, India, uh, such an incredibly beautiful country and one that we are so blessed to be working in. Uh, this, these are just some pictures from travels that me and mom have taken together during our work. Uh, it just takes your breath away, uh, uh, the incredible amount of richness that we have in our country. Um, it's something we must protect. It's something we must learn to respect. And as architects and designers, we are blessed with an opportunity to really work with the environment that we have and what is around us. So um, I don't think I, my mom and I would ever want to work anywhere else but in our country. And uh, traveling 
uh, is one thing that architecture allows us to have and allows us to discover different parts of it. And we're always very grateful. So this is uh, some of our travel pictures. Uh, as architects and designers, I'm sure you all have to be exposed to the heat, uh, to the cold, uh, to different geographies. And that's, that's where the fun lies. So you can see this is actually the same site and from uh, white, white, uh, white uh, soil, we have red, deep red soil. I mean, it's just the gamut of, of uh, beauty and diversity that we have in the country is so wide. And we love every moment of it. So I think we all uh, uh, know and value uh, travel and how much it gives to us as designers and architects. It also allows us to collaborate abroad. Uh, this was uh, a, a project very close to our hearts. Uh, it was uh, an exhibition called India and the World where we collaborated with the British Museum and uh, CSMDS in Mumbai and the Delhi National Museum. And it was an opportunity uh, to really understand the history of objects, to learn about uh, a whole nother field, which is museumology and preservation of objects and curation, and to be able to learn from people uh, across the world and to collaborate and also contribute our Indian ethics idea and culture to it was uh, really a once in a lifetime opportunity. On the left, you see us in the bowels of the uh, British Museum, looking at some of the Indus Valley um, objects, which are you know, thousands of years old and the amount of respect and, and uh, uh, careful care that is taken with each of these objects taught us to have the same respect for those objects. Uh, both of us in the middle and then on the right again, you can see the objects laid out in scale. There were over 200 objects displayed uh, during this exhibit, which was uh, held in Mumbai. Conservation, uh, very close uh, to uh, our hearts and really began because of the passion and love that my mother has for uh, old buildings and their history and their legacy. Um, on the left, we are at uh, Rajabai Tower, uh, walking up. You can see how narrow that staircase is on the right. Um, there's uh, absolutely no light, uh, one or two small windows as you're climbing up to the turret. But it's such a spatial experience. The story that old buildings are able to tell us um, uh, cannot uh, be be experienced in any other way. And I guess that's where my love for research also comes in. So uh, to be able to combine my mother's love for old buildings and my love for history and research is really what's culminated into SNK's practice for conservation today. And it's also a responsibility that she taught us that every architect must have. And I think what uh, she has always said and what we practice today is that you don't need to have uh, a degree in conservation. Every architect should be inherently a conservation architect. And it can be conservation of smaller projects or smaller objects or smaller buildings. But it is such an important part of ensuring that we are able to save uh, the heritage and history of our cities and continue to tell that story. Uh, sites and buildings. Uh, these are some of the fun pictures that uh, and, and journeys that we've had on the left. Uh, this was before COVID, but we still covered ourselves uh, with scarves because there was so much uh, uh, dust on the site. I think this was at around uh, nine o'clock at night. We actually stayed all night there on site. So you can see us in our um, uh, kind of uh, uh, walking shoes and our our clothes uh, look rugged as we've been there most of the day and night and probably the most fun part of uh, project completions. In the middle, of course, doing larger projects, uh, collaborating again on, um, on tall buildings, uh, learning about uh, designing new buildings, how to do it structurally, how does it become relevant to building in India. Um, this is also a very exciting and important part of our practice. And finally, right again, uh, this is in the Northeast, 
where we traveled to Shillong and Meghalaya, such a beautiful part of our country, and experiencing the root bridges, and you know, really being inspired by what we see, and use some of that inspiration and and put it towards the design and architecture that we do. Uh, I think across the years, uh, as my mother's journey has been one where she's been alone, there have also been uh, wonderful people that she's had the opportunity uh, to be with, meet with, ideate with, and be supported by. Uh, on the left, uh, this is a trip in 1995 that I had. Uh, I was very fortunate to join her uh, to meet Jeffrey Bava in Sri Lanka. And there you can see him and he would he took us all around Kandalama himself. And um, it was just uh, so special to hear about uh, how uh, he described his buildings and his love for his country. Um, in the middle, uh, of course, architect uh, Doshi with my mother. And uh, they, of course, have a very special relationship. Uh, and as can be seen with the, this animated photo, which I love so much, where uh, there is such a, a meeting of minds and uh, discussion, uh, I think academic discussion, which my mother loves so much, especially with him. And on the right, uh, architect Charles Korea, who I think uh, over here launched one of our books for Hekar uh, in the opening and was so supportive uh, to us in that entire process and again has been uh, very connected with my mother through the years. So uh, the masters in their own rights uh, being a, an, a complete uh, influence to their work, to their gesture, uh, to, uh, to their humility and uh, being able to be exposed to that is a, a great honor as well as something that uh, I think uh, you'd be looked back on at SNK and feel very fortunate about. Collaborations beyond the waters, the masters that we find uh, in the US. Here we have Todd and Billy Sien. Uh, uh, we have uh, very fortunately collaborated with them on a project here in Mumbai for uh, TCS. Uh, they are now the architects of the Obama Library. Uh, and this is us with them and their team. We've worked with them for over 12 years. Um, and what an experience, uh, one of the greatest lessons we can take away from them is is their uh, absolute amazing sense of design and commitment and detailing but the extreme humility uh, which comes with it and their passion for the work that they do is is absolutely breathtaking so uh, these are uh, professional relationships that have turned into friendships uh, over many many years and for which we are very grateful. And collaboration really is the way forward. We must collaborate not only across the waters, we must collaborate within our country. It's very important that we don't treat uh, our, uh, architects and architecture firms as independent silos here and only be willing to collaborate uh, with firms from abroad. I think for the future of what we have and the future we want to build, collaboration here is going to be very important. This is a moment I think caught uh, that that our, one of our colleagues caught between mom and me. I think we were both answering a question uh, as as architecture does. You know, it's it's a it's we're waiting for the aha moment. I think both of us we were we were trying to answer something, but here set in a backdrop of one of our projects where again we feel it's so important to incorporate the history uh, of, of the company and you see some archival photographs there uh, above us. So uh, again here, just uh, one more moment on site uh, in the middle of a working day, uh, which catches us both sitting far away from each other, but knowing exactly what we're both thinking. This is when I have pushed her to complete and total exhaustion and uh, uh, we were in the midst of uh, a lot of work in the studio, but also had to finish uh, uh, the book we were doing. So uh, I think we enjoy being busy. I know my mother does. She uh, really uh, thrives in a busy and continuous environment and pushes us all to as well. 
But I think for once we caught in a moment where <laughs> it was a moment of, oh my gosh, these people. So it's one of our fun moments. And that's what work has to be. I recall the first day I joined work. And uh, at the end of the day, I went to my mom and I said, is work supposed to be this fun? And she laughed and she said, yes, it is. And that's a good, good sign. So that's how it's been for the last 14, 15 years for me and certainly 40 years for her. So I think this picture certainly sums it up. Again, an extension of our amazing team. Uh, and this the idea of a team extends to everything. Uh, this is the, uh, the team who worked with us on our book, Rituraj Parekh, uh, uh, Anthea Fernandez, Ishita Parekh, and uh, my mom and myself. Uh, it was really uh, making sure that her story was told and the work of the studio was um, uh, chronicled uh, through this monograph. And uh, we feel very blessed we were able to do this and bring it out. Uh, this is some images of, of, of my journey working through the space, whether it's working on the floor. I think as designers, we find ourselves working everywhere. We've worked on a footpath before because we were thrown out of the site and they were closing up and we had to work there, whether it's on the floor of an office, on the back of a car. Um, we end up taking so many photographs in, in this digital age and we find photographs of beautiful doors of detail. I always find myself uh, clicking those and archiving them. Uh, uh, finding, of course, on our sites that look uh, quite incomplete, but in our heads, we are so excited because we know what it's going to look like a few weeks from there. And the last picture on the right is a very pregnant me, uh, a, a shadow of it, and how uh, life is also work. Um, and I recall my mother telling me a story of when she uh, was had to go visit a site and she was about nine, almost nine, eight and a half months pregnant with my brother, ready to deliver. And she climbed up to the top of the roof of the site and her, her mother was shouting from below saying, Brinda, you really should not be doing this at this, at this juncture. And she always said, I remember seeing women construction workers uh, on, on top there looking at me and they identified that, you know, here's another woman who's an architect, but she is working through, through her pregnancy. And I had to do the same and I worked through both my children's pregnancies and um, a, a lot of learning from my mother there. This is my mother and her various hairstyles to the time I've been with her. Of course, through my life, they vary. On the left, we have her in, in Shillong, uh, on the water, on the Brahmaputra edge. Uh, you know, and this was quite a sophisticated style there. Uh, in, the, in the second one is with my father having a few drinks down. So the hair is a little more ruffled. And in the third one, we call it the adventurous look. Um, quite modern, uh, another phase. And of course, the last one is her favorite one, which is in, in her construction cap. So uh, kind of covering all, all the different moments uh, and capturing uh, her there. Uh, this is um, uh, us with uh, our, our, our two products uh, on the left is my mom with me on the left and my brother on my right. Uh, on the right, and uh, uh, my brother is three years older than me and lives in New York, and we miss him dearly every day, but he's a very important part of our lives. And uh, um, mom took us everywhere with her, um, and we lived in our office. Uh, likewise, on the right, uh, a little old, uh, younger pictures of my babies. I have two boys, and uh, spending time with them and bringing them to office. But now they have their grandmother there, so. They are quite entertained in her office for a while. Um, so uh, it's a continuation and SNK extends to our family um, as it did for me and it now does for my children. Uh, nothing is possible without the support uh, of family. And uh, I think both my mother and I are very blessed that we are and we're able to achieve and do what we do today because of our family. Um, uh, my father is a cardiac surgeon, was in the army, and uh, I remember if my mom was late at work and she, in the morning, was my father's duty, and he would get up in the mornings and look after us kids so my mom could rest a bit, 
and evening mom would be back and look after us uh so that's really the support that they've they've given us and likewise my husband here has done the same for me and my children um and continues to support uh uh, uh the kids while i work as i do with him and my brother of course from new york continues to support both my mom and me by uh, i'll show you right at the end he always had some commentary on our work and supporting in, in his own way our extended family uh this is our snk family um many of the people have been with my mother for now 20 25 years um and i've known ever since i was at uh, visiting the office as a little girl and uh today they continue when i joined they continue to work with me and today people have been with me 10 and 12 years so it's really uh, uh i think architecture is not a solo sport it is a team sport so anybody who tells you that they've done something on their own um i think you know has to be a little more truthful about the process it really is a group of people who are passionate and love what they do and come together and able to develop great ideas and at snk we're very very fortunate to have the most amazing group of people to work with and every day we're very thankful for the same friends uh I think my mother and I have both have our oldest set of friends who continue to be our friends uh, for our lifetime. On the left are my group of friends. We do a trip every year. Uh, I I get away from work and we visit a different part of India. Again, this was in the northeast. Uh, they're all in different professions. Uh, one is a filmmaker, one is a PR guy, and one is um, uh, an advertising. and that's what i love about them and they're my friends from school and they support me through my work and they're as passionate about the work they do on the right is my mom with her friends in at her farm house at the beach and they are also um, many in the architecture and design field all who love what they do all share with her what they do and as you can see all huddling together on a cold uh, december uh, evening watching the sunset at our speech so for both of us uh, having our close group of friends that have supported us through uh, all our adventures of work and our personal lives has been extremely important this is probably a picture of mom and me both at the same age uh, when mom well was a similar age as i am on the right and i thought it was um, one of the pictures i love most about her it's the one i've seen the most even growing up uh her sari is that's how i remember her sarees um black white and red um printed uh whether it was a ikat pattern uh it's very distinctly in my mind and uh today you know when i show this other picture of me uh, juxtaposed with hers it's wonderful that both of us are doing uh, at that age what we love to do the most architecture at the time of covid we've all been separated from our snk family but we were very fortunate 10 days before covid uh, lockdown happened we had moved everybody to work from home and we proudly can say that the studio has run uh, since the day of lockdown we have not stopped work for even one day and we're very um, fortunate that our snk family and all of us were able to work together so this was um while we were in lockdown uh, it was challenging everybody had to develop new ways of working of collaborating but together we have managed and we're continuing to work so so i think covid has been another challenge that as a studio uh, we were able uh, and continue to be able to work through together finally uh, we just recently were on site together uh, uh, on the left you can see the site we visited in covid Uh, and mom and me in the middle so my brother sent us this wonderful little cartoon uh, we all love star wars and he said uh, oh um, nandini are you saying are you my mummy and mom of course in her dark vader mask saying uh, no luke i am your father so um my brother continues to be amused by all the pictures we sent him from our site but um as uh, i think my mother always needs to say uh everything must go on this too shall pass and we have to continue working 
and that's the philosophy we have continued to take we have continued to work during this lockdown um uh, we have to do it very carefully um assessing risk making sure everybody is carrying out everything as per regulations but uh things must continue and that is what we've been doing so finally uh, we hope that all these images uh, have encompassed these three words uh, which mean so much to me uh, live love and learn um, which has been uh, the philosophy of our lives and how snk has grown over these many decades thank you thank you so much architects brinda and nandini for sharing your wonderful personal journeys into architecture both individual and shared and how gracefully together you've built a multi generational practice that is a representation of your mutual interests concerns also for the love of the country its heritage that you share and portray through your work and of course emphasizing on joy and fun in practice such an inspiring joyous presentation thank you so much with this we would like to open our session for conversation we would like to invite the audience to please share your questions for the architects please type in your question uh, before we begin the moderation audience we would like to share a short film um which uh, basically encompasses the book that brinda and architect mandini have worked on so We lived in Calcutta till I was about uh, eight or nine years old. We were just two daughters, my sister Ranjini and I. So we grew up with a with a lot of freedom. When we were quite young, we used to travel all over India, and I remember even today standing on the steps in Nalanda at the ancient ruins of the old Buddhist university and being mesmerized in a way by the brick and the ruins and imagining what it must have been. So I guess um, my interest in archaeology and architecture, perhaps in some way, was born at that time. Well, as you know, I set up the Hekar Foundation in two thousand, which is an acronym for Heritage, Education, Conservation, Architecture, and Restoration. So my first experience with uh, publishing came at that time uh, because we were. Uh, and a non-profit organization and we had many interests we began to publish books ourselves but i never ever thought of publishing a book about my work and uh, when nandini came into the practice um there were i had more opportunity and more time uh, to accept invitations around the world to lecture and also to teach in my own way and i remember after every uh, lecture that i gave people would come up to me and ask me uh where can we get a book on your work and uh, that was a strange question for me that people were asking me for a book on my work i guess there's always an anxiety for me that uh what happens when she goes and i want all of this to remain in a way one thing i was very clear that the book had to be my voice i wanted to tell my story it had to be my narrative of course i got enormous amount of help from the team we began just accumulating the information so just putting together old drawings and right from her thesis days to you know almost 35 years ago that really took its time as well all three of us me nadini and mrs sawara sure that you know it will be an exercise which will be more reflective where we kind of look back at the practice and see what values it has built over the years the ideas of curation from ritraj as to how the book should be structured without it being overwhelming as there were over 200 projects that were built across these decades but that there be several aspects and i think that's another very important part that miss samaya herself and i wanted that the book have the vital milestone projects that created um and really pushed the firm further across the decades that it um had dialogues that uh, were important in conversation because i think her interests go so beyond architecture they go into history they go into the city 
into urban development, into uh, so many other aspects of life as architecture does. These dialogues between Mrs. Soma and uh, the people uh, who have known her uh, in different capacities, but are professionally equal to her, coming from very different diverse backgrounds, uh, like Arun Shori, who has this, um, this strong political, uh, journalistic, uh, philosophical view of India. And uh, he and Mrs. Somaya, they talk about India uh, in very sort of in, in the, from the different perspectives. With Sanyu Doshi, it was about culture. Uh, you know, she being a curator, um, uh, raised the question that whether architecture is a cultural production, of course it is, but what value then does it hold? Similarly, with Kamu Ayer at Mary Norman Woods, he had one conversation which was just about practicing from Bombay. The structure of the book becomes interesting. It just doesn't become a long narrative, which is singular, but it's constantly dynamic as a reader goes through it. The essays were not just about me, but was the context of architecture and in some ways how the practice existed at that time, how it affected architecture, what it meant. So there are many, many angles to this book and I think that's what makes it quite unique in many ways. It's, it was also important for me that this book should be readable by students of architecture and uh, I hope they will learn from it. For the book, we revisited many, many projects that were uh, mostly done over the period of 40 years. So uh, the kind of project that was built past um, 20 years back and uh, we had read a lot about it in the office. We had studied a lot of material about it. We knew how the project looked like, but those were shot back then when they were done. It was so exciting to go and see how the project looked now. We wanted the work to be honest and we wanted to show it honestly and that it still holds good for today. And there is a sense of timelessness. And that sense of timelessness also has to hold good with the book. Though she's, she has a very modern aspect in her architecture, she still is rooted very uh, strongly. Like she has one foot in both worlds. So we had, that had to come out in the design as well. She had a very beautiful, uh, emotion and a thought behind why she wants to write it and she was very clear that this was going to be her story which was told very honestly. By not having the word architecture in, in the title uh, and having the word works is important because uh, as Mrs. Sumaya says, uh, it's, it's, the practice is not just about architecture. The work does not limit itself to the aspects of uh, doing architecture and building. It is a cultural practice, it's a social practice, it's, it's a practice in economics and of, of craft and, 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 and a very different, um, it, it touches all these diverse and, and unbelievably wide disciplines and somehow uh, she is the, you know, once she said, a conductor of a very disorganized orchestra. Of course my role will change, of course responsibilities will change, uh, what I do with my time will change how much time I want to spend uh, doing certain things will also change. But I don't think that I can ever be separated uh, from architecture because it really, it's my entire being. Thank you so much for sharing this beautiful film on the making of your book, uh, Work in Continuities. We really hope the audience will get a copy of it to learn more about uh, the practice and architect Brinda Somaya's journey. Thank you so much once again for your wonderful presentations. With this, we would like to open the session for conversation. Thank you, architect Zinda and the architect Nandini. It was an amazing presentation and it was just what we were looking forward to hear from you. Uh, I would like to uh, request Varsha to start with the moderation questions. Uh, hello, uh, hello, Brinda and Nandini. Uh, it was very nice hearing uh, both of you and the 
and your journey it was indeed very inspirational especially for a young architect like me and my first question is for uh, architect vinda uh, it is nearly a uh, four decades since you started practice uh, it is really a long time but uh, what keeps you thriving for new work new design new concept uh, what is your mantra for this well you know uh, the country has changed so much our practice has changed it's uh, grown and uh, every project is a challenge uh, whatever comes we look at it as something different whether it's the land the requirements the client the user so i just think that uh, you know architects uh, unlike certain other professions can work <laughs> to quite a, a much more senior age than many other professions and i think we're lucky because um, i feel we can do it so i think it's just the excitement and and just loving what we do you know i think it's, that's all there is to it and waiting to see what what the solutions will be the creativity process the brainstorming then converting all that into drawings and then seeing the buildings and or whether it's a garden a park whether it's something for the city whether it's protecting a monument or protecting open space all these things where activists where architects where conservationists where uh, city uh, urban planners where planners generally where academicians where educationists so everything we are we are part of that i'm now um editing guest editor of a, of a australian journal on acoustics i'm chairperson of the school of planning and architecture in vijayawada so it's but it's all connected with our profession and that's the beauty of it so as long as i'm fit and able to to work and think uh i hope i'll be able to go on that's very nice thank you moving on to nishika thank you architect vinda my question is to architect nandini what is it that fascinated you into design after law and what is it that you have taken away from your practice in law and political science that adds a perspective to your architecture and design practice um so to answer your first question nishita i think um, i miss the creative side of my brain being used uh, um i think uh being a lawyer yes it can be creative in a way but you know i i grew up drawing and i grew up kind of putting together things and and with uh parents who helped me travel and understand art and design and so law was law helped me in so many ways and as my grandfather said no education is ever wasted and i could not be more true um it it teaches it taught me how to think differently uh, uh, law taught me how to be more structured i remember when i first joined snk um uh, my mother i said where are all your contracts and she said what contracts i have good faith and i said no no more good faith so suddenly here i was turning everything upside down doing you know bringing contracts bringing in emails so and she was Uh, I was very fortunate. She was very open to everything, and all of that changed initially. So the legal side, um, also ultimately, architects architecture is also business. So it, you know, uh, I think I try not to tell people I'm a lawyer before we get into the talk of of contracts, etc. Uh, just let it kind of roll out. But it's certainly everything I've learned is added value. Um, as I said, my political science background, there was exposure. um to so many different types of people so many parts of the world um and teaches you to think and architecture is uh, the master of the arts it covers all professions so i think if you be, you know if you are an expert in in or have exposure in one it's just a piece of a little more information as an architect so for me um i think the transference it's a blessing having both both the skills and um the move to architecture i think as one said i i didn't hold my nose like this i decided to take the long road so as long as i reach the destination and you wake up every morning saying i love what i do it doesn't matter how hard i have to work then then you're good to go and i'm fortunately i can say that i'm fortunate thank you architect nandini may i say that i 
love the way you integrate Star Wars into all of your presentations. <laughs> yes, it does come in. <laughs> yes, it's been a great experience. So my next question would be that uh, I was a part of the Women in Design 2020 conference and uh, the Women in 2020 conference was a beautiful curation of some of the best designers in the world. It, in, it was indeed a pleasure to be a part of that conference and I'm definitely taking back a lifetime of learning from all the presenters and everybody there. And it was a great platform to discuss uh, and contemplate gender differences and how it affects everyone in this sector. So having said this, do you think biases for gender exist even in today's practice? If yes, what would be the means to achieve a gender balanced workspace? And what are the measures that you have taken as a practice to achieve this? This is a uh, question to both of you, to both architect Brinda and Nandini. I'll, I'll let Mrs. Maya answer. First. I was going to say, I'll let Nandini answer that. <laughs> so you better start. <laughs> okay. um, of course, as, as we know, the percentage of young women now in architecture schools is more than men. Unfortunately, when it comes into practice, that percentage flips. And what we've seen is that young women need support, especially through marriage, after they have children, they have to possibly you know, look after older parents, especially in India. That's the time where they need an incredible amount of support. Um, as far as our studio is concerned, we're very clear that, um, that we encourage all our women architects to have their children, we give them part-time hours, flexi hours when they want to come back. We've actually, if they need the time out for a few months post having the child, that flexibility is available. I think there has to be, um, I think often women understand women and you need to have senior women at these positions to be more sensitive to uh, their staff to ensure that you can encourage women to continue working. And often it's, uh, we find the case that, and Ms. Maya used to say this all the time. She said, don't let two, three, five years pass after you've got married or after you've had children where you stop working because you tend to lose touch with the profession. But even if then you do decide to come back, come back, take a course, you know, have the confidence and, and get back to work. So I think that, you know, there has been incredible change since she started. But yes, even today, uh, I, I know several times I remember going for a presentation to an academic institution with a male colleague of mine. And uh, when we entered, uh, when we started, they all looked at him and said, so why don't you start presenting? And he said, no, actually, you know, she is my senior and she will be presenting. So, you know, that happens all the time. I remember Ms. Sumaya and I walking into a room and they continued to look behind us to see who else was coming. So this, these, these are all these things we notice, but honestly, she and I never notice it because the point is you shouldn't realize it in your own head. You should be confident enough to go there and do whatever you have to do and present the way you have to and be confident of it. And that's really most of the battle. And that's probably uh, one of my greatest gifts that she's taught me through the years. So I'll transfer it to her, the question now for her to answer. I think we're not just very kind to women, we're very kind to the men in our office. Yeah, because yeah. many of them come and say, ma'am, today is open day. Ma'am, today somebody's not well. Ma'am, I have to go over here. I have to go over there. So I say, what about your wife? Oh, she won't get leave. <laughs> so what that is said, you know, that, that we understand things. And it doesn't devalue anything. It actually enhances the practice. It makes us a family. It makes us all work together, especially now in COVID times. We've had two or three people within our office whose parents have got it, whose grandfathers got it, or whose husbands got it. Everyone's open, you know. They're honest with us. They tell us this is the situation. How, how are we going to support each other? And the whole, everyone does that. So it's, it's not just women. We have to support the men in our office as well equally. Uh, because they have their own issues sometimes with, with their wives or whatever working in organizations which may not understand some of these issues. So the, the idea is to create a gender equality. Uh, you know, Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg, who just died, she fought equally hard for men as she fought for women. 
In fact, her very first case was, uh, was fighting for a man whose wife died and he wanted paid leave to look after his child, but he was discriminated against because he was a man. And that was the first case she won, where she said, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, if the spouse dies and you need to look after your child, you should get all the support. So that's what the future should be for us. Thank you, Architect Nanda and Architect Nandini. It's an amazing perspective to get what the future holds to us. Over to Varsha. Hi, uh, thank, thank you. And uh, the continuation of the same question, uh, uh, even though we see a huge difference between men and women ratio in schools and practice, uh, for some reasons, uh, the ratio drastically change, changes uh, when when they in the continuation of their practice. So, uh, so how do you think? How can we make the environment better uh, for the women so that they can uh, one can come back and continue practice? Thank you. Well, I think we sort of answered that in a way in the last question. But uh, personally, I have found after our, la our Women in Architecture in 2000, one of the biggest problems were women who lost confidence to come back to work after five years or so. So what we did, a group of us got together and we uh, started courses, uh, short six-month courses where women, where many of us from different, you know, men and women from different studios uh, helped some of these women in terms of software, in terms of the latest technology to get back to work. And we found that within three months, they had the confidence and they said, fine, we're ready to go. The second thing is when, is to hire, when you hire people, uh, you don't necessarily have to look at a gap in their CV or in their resume as being something not good. You know, you have to uh, accept that gap and assess them as they are today. I think that's, that also will help women. But many companies are working towards this and I think there have been huge changes. So I think the time has come while women might acknowledge these issues, they must not let that dominate their profession. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a woman architect or a doctor or a lawyer or even a, a poor woman domestic servant, you have the same problems. So get out there, fight for your rights, work hard, celebrate your success and don't moan and groan. That's my philosophy. That's wonderful. And uh, architect Nandini, what do you have? Uh, any thoughts? My thoughts are a reflection of exactly what my mother says. She says it to me all the time. No more than groaning, get back to it. So that's really the anthem. <laughs> and moving on to the next question. So uh, this is again for both of you. Uh, when do you think is the right time for an aspired architect to start on their own practice? And uh, what are the qualities like one should be skillful of before starting their own practice. Thank you. Well, um, you know, it, there, there's no one answer fits all for this question. It really depends on who you are, where you are, and what you want to do. The only thing I, I tell young people when I lecture, you know, if I go to colleges or universities to talk to architecture students, that whether you're working for somebody else or whether you're starting on your own, the most important thing is to take a project, however big or small it is. It may not be a building, it might be an open space, it might be a, an old uh, monument, whatever. But finish what you're going to do. Take the whole project and ask, finish it from beginning to end. Because once you get the confidence of doing one project, all aspects of it, then only you will grow. As long as you're on an assembly line doing little bits and pieces of something like a car manufacturer or aerospace manufacturer, you're not going to grow. So choose wisely where you join, which studio you join. You don't just join at that time for compensation. If you can afford not to, choose the studio wisely. And also perhaps work a year or two before you run abroad to do a master's degree. Some people go straight. I went straight. But... Uh, working in India a year or two is, is also a good way of then going abroad uh, if you do want to study further. And of course, today there are lots of colleges within this country itself uh, where you can get many postgraduate degrees. 
So a postgraduate degree depends. So it really varies. I don't think there's a single answer. Each one will find, they have to have confidence that they will find their path. And I'm sure all of, all of them will. Great. Thank you. And uh, the next question is from Nishita. You're on, you're on mute, Nishita. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, so I just wanted to know your opinion uh, on this. Considering the effects of architecture and new constructions as one of the contributors of climate change, how important is sustainability in the process of designing? And as a young designer, I would like to know your opinion on local and vernacular practices as a design change in the next 10 to 20 years and how we can grow with them. That's yours, Nandini. Um, well, I think um, sustainability is, you know, it's just, it became a trending word for so many years and now it's become a, a real living, livable problem. We're all facing it in our lives every day, whether it's climatic, whether it's urban issues, with rural issues. And I think as architects, as you see the academic uh, curriculum today, in the last, I would say, maybe, you know, seven, eight years, sustainability has been included in all the architectural curriculums now because they've realized the immense importance for architects to understand that as a basic part of the course. But at the same time, I think that the practical aspects of sustainability are very different. And, you know, I think, as Ms. Sumaya said, working with studios that actually implement it, uh, not just in one aspect. So it really has to come during the design process as an underlining aspect. It must be natural that you're looking at orientation and passive cooling and you know, uh, whether it's trees and vegetation and water conservation, and all those aspects become very basic. And then when you go to the actual land, when you're looking geographically, you have to study the community. You have to look at how you're affecting that community. How are you sourcing things locally? So it's not just a checklist anymore. It has to become a very integral part of the working process of an architect. And that is something, you know, I think, um, I think the first five or six years that I worked at the studio, I shadowed Miss Sumaya. I, I didn't do much else. I just shadowed and watched. And I think learning how, um, you know, learning from senior people in studios, watching how they work, watching their design philosophies, and then applying your understanding. Today, uh, our generation or the next generation knows so much more. I mean, you have the Greta Thunbergs of the world that are talking in, and waking up in a very different uh, world than, than all of us have experienced. So uh, sustainability is now what we are living, eating and breathing. And when it comes to the construction industry, there's a lot, a lot of work to be done. It's not just from a building aspect. It has to be how we deal with construction debris. Where does all that debris go? How are landfills dealt with? How are we de dealing with sustainability on an urban level, on an urban planning level? You know, what is, you know, can we partner with uh, local governments, with state governments, with national governments to help design better? You know, so I think there also has to be an involvement of all of us. As Ms. Sumaya says, no project is too small. Even as young architects, you know, you take, you see, look at your local area. Is there and a small old water fountain? Is there an old temple? Is there an old bungalow? Is there something that can be saved in the community? Is there something that can be done? That's sustainability. Old buildings have an incredible uh, energy and embodied energy that exists. So saving that is part of it. And then I think India is doing its own part. I mean, we're one of the only countries today, if I say plastic, it's amazing to see Indians go, no, we don't use plastic anymore, but you go to other parts of the country and they still are. So we can all do it. We can adapt. We can learn, uh, you know, but uh, in a country like ours, it's a lot of work. There are a lot of people and a lot of things to be done. So each of us have to do our part. And if each of us do a small part, imagine the impact we can have together. Thank you. I think that answered the question really well. Varsha? Yes. Uh... My question is, um, it, it, 
so uh, eventually the architectural practice uh, eventually becomes a business more uh, more about business and very less uh, mm. than the design so uh, so uh, and in business there are uh, many high and low points and how, how to make sure uh, to sustain uh, ourselves in the business as a successful practice uh, which has learned for uh, so many decades uh, what do you think what is the secret of the success in that area well i am very clear about uh, certain aspects of the profession uh, the value system the ethics and the integrity of the practice there is no compromise there with snpa and this is not just snpa but it has to come down to all the people who are our consultants who work with us uh, we have to make it very very clear what is a code of ethics that we follow we actually incorporate this code of ethics into our contract with all clients uh, luckily for us we have had over the years very good both institutional and corporate clients who have supported us on this and i am sure uh, i am not going to stand in judgment of other firms uh, i am sure we may have lost many jobs because we believe in working in this particular way but we also have built up our reputation of integrity because of the way we work and so i'm sure we get many projects this way when we when the client knows that the only fees that snk will make or the only money that snk makes from any project will be the fees that the client pays us now to enable us to survive on that it is very important that we get a decent fee and that is why the council of architecture has specified and recommended a fee structure but unfortunately it is only a recommendation and it is not compulsory but we use it by and large for all our projects and we fight for the council of architecture fee and if a client says well i can get something done half the price and quarter the price uh, even if i tell them that this is the way we work Uh, and if they don't understand that, then let them go. They're not the people we want to work with. That's not how we want to work. But that's very rare, and most clients, I think, appreciate that this is the fee we work for. So if they say we're expensive, we have to convince them that we're not expensive. We're just asking for the council fee, which is a, a very, <laughs> relatively low percentage compared to what can go wrong if you go outside and and decide to break your ethical code of conduct. so we are very very clear on that and architects as a professional group unfortunately um undercut each other and this uh, is very unfortunate because uh when if the council says that we should be at a 5% or 6% and you are putting half percent or 1% you can't survive it's impossible and then all the other unfortunate situations come into So sometimes people tell me oh now it's easy for you you built up your reputation as in kane and then is there this that and the other but this was always the case this is how we have always worked we have never compromised and that is why if work is not done to our standard we can tell the contractor break it down because we are we have nothing to fear we have no obligation to him we can ensure good quality we can ensure that things are done in a particular way so not only do nandini and i have the freedom but the entire office has the freedom to work in a absolutely unrestricted way always in the interest of the project and the client that's very nice uh, over to nishita uh architect vrinda and architect nandini we will now move on to some of the audience questions that have come in So the first question is from Nandita Babu how do you have a personal relationship with each other while also working together do you have conflict of interests and ideas in case so how do you resolve them constructively <laughs> well engineer who is now a profession of property appraising he has a wide network of connections i am in a dilemma if i should break free and start everything on my own or if i should use the platform 
my dad has and build a career, what would you suggest? Ma'am, you want me to? Oh, I think why don't you answer this? So young people asking the questions. So I think we should. I think this is twofold. One is, uh, if you're in our office, you can probably hear my mother and me from opposite ends of the office. We literally have, we're very loud and you will know when, uh, you know, we're having a, a discussion where we do not agree. But the irony lies that I remember once I was in a meeting, I went into a meeting, I met a client and I had a discussion. I went out, then my mother went independently into the meeting, had a discussion and came out and then she and I met in her room and I said, you know, this is what I said. And she said, you're joking because this is what I said. He's going to think we both discuss this with each other. We sound absolutely crazy. So it was amazing how both of us had given the identical piece of advice and the same decision, even though we hadn't discussed anything with each other. So I think ultimately, um, it often happens where both of us literally say the same thing. But there are many a times when we don't agree. And I think when we started, my mother, as a parent does, very, I think, gently let me kind of understand or kind of convince me of how things should be. And now our relationship is very seamless. I think years of working together, we kind of know when one is out of the mood, you know, off mood or one is on mood and it just works seamlessly together. I mean, I'll give you a small, you know, example. I mean, even when I'm running, she was doing the presentation today. I didn't have to know when she, I knew when she wanted me to go to the next side. It's just, it becomes subliminal. When you're talking about working with a parent, um, I think it's the greatest gift. And if you, if your parent has taught you Humility, you must put your ego down and understand you must learn from them and that it is a learning process and that is the greatest learnings you can get. I have seen many practices where the children have gone off on their own and as they become older, uh, they've come back to merge with their parents. And I thought, my gosh, how many years they have lost because I was so lucky that I've always been with her and I've had probably, you know, triple the amount of time. But at the same time, I think it's subjective. It's, um, and, you know, it's an independent choice. And the time will come when you realize. But let me tell you that joining the firm is not that you're given something. You have to earn your place. You have to earn your keep. It was probably, you know, eight, nine years before I could even start getting people to come to me so they would not come to my cabin. They would go to hers as they, as they had been going for so many years. And it took many years after I joined SNK for slight diversions to happen. So, so I will interrupt here. So now I, Nandini sits out in the common uh, office space where we have, you know, and I'm the only one in the entire office who has a cabin because after lunch I can have a 10 minute ziz if I want. And um, now the, the queues are all outside hers and I'm really enjoying myself having a good time reading, chatting with my friends, writing articles and when they really have fire, they have to you know shoot something or, or come up with a big decision then they will come in. So as she said you have to earn your place and also I think you have I think the parent also it works both ways because no two people are the same. So, of course, the office is going to change. The office is going to, because now the, the, the office is full of much younger people. I'm the oldest one by, you know, maybe one other person is a bit younger than me. But now we're full of young people in their 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, max. So, they bring in a new, a new vibrancy, new ideas, new thoughts. And that freedom has to be given. To give that freedom to not just Nandini, but her team of people. Uh, you have to have confidence that they know what they're doing and you have to let go. And sometimes you have to believe that even if you need to say something, let go and, the, and they're capable of doing it. So to answer the young man's question is, he has to understand the relationship with the parent. And also the parent also has to be able to uh, let the team and the younger people in the team and their own child 
uh, build up a new organization with new with new thoughts, new ideas, because the jobs are going to be different. The profession is going to change. You can't live in the past. So I'm quite happy to actually uh, enjoy the free time that I'm having now. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Amarish Gala. He says, uh, nearly 80% of Indians with greater ratio of women live in the rural villages and towns, sites, and spaces of diverse heritage in India. Do you both as in integrational and ethical travelers think that architects and designers in India are engaging with the greater half of the country? I'm going to let Nandini that, but I'm going to say hello to Amar. Amar is a good friend of ours and showed us the beauty of uh, Vijayawada and the surroundings. And I mean, that's another story, but Nandini, you answer Amar's question. Um, I, I think that, I think there needs to be more engagement. And there needs to be, I think it's amazing when you go into these smaller areas, how aware people are, especially the next generation. Um, they are so politically aware. They're so savvy in different ways. As you go in different parts of India, of course, it's very different. I think as young designers, we remember in college, we always get taken off to these amazing places for our, for our annual uh, trips to uh, you know, document temples and smaller villages and smaller. And, and I think there must be a commitment um, and a part of the firm that can dedicate its services to these parts of India. And I think if each firm and or each individual chooses maybe one rural part of India where they can commit their time to in a different way, um, that will be definitely assisting you know, uh, we can have a lot of impact, but there is a lot of gaps, um, you know, in, in uh, there are a lot of governmental issues. How do architects and designers get involved uh, in even in urban areas? We struggle uh, forget, you know, uh, uh, secondary tier two, tier three and even rural areas. And I also think we have to be very cautious as designers when we go into uh, villages, rural areas. We have to understand them. We must be patient. We have to study them. We can't go in there uh, bringing all our uh, kind of fancy ideas and, and pencil and paper and sit down. And this is what we learn from the masters, you know, the, the ability to, you know, get down and, and, and take the time to understand people. And I think one of the greatest things that uh, Ms. Somaya taught me and probably law school as well is actually there's a class we have in law school where you're not supposed to talk you spend the whole class listening and you know i you know by by default we all love talking but what if you spent an hour just listening and then after that hour you what do you take away from that so i think one of the greatest uh, uh, learnings that we can do is listen and so perhaps um, i think there are many answers to this we need to get out there more if we do get out there we need to be more sensitive and take more time and spend, um, make more of an effort as designers and how we're going to help uh, help people on that scale. And for that, we need to be listeners. Okay, I think that was a very good point made. I think we should def definitely try to put a lot of effort in understanding people more than just giving them a blind design. And uh, here is the last question of, uh, for today. Uh, and it is uh, about COVID. Uh, so in past 40 years, uh, definitely there, were, uh, there might be a lot of, you have seen a lot of shifts in architectural uh, practice. So how, how do you think COVID-19 has uh, uh, changed anything for architects? And uh, is there any, much difference between architectural practice which is happening or the whole society 
Well, you know, architects in India hardly affect uh, under 5% of the population. That means wherever we as architects are practicing, it's mainly in the urban areas. We don't really affect the rest of our 1.3 billion people at all. And that's the tragedy of our profession in a way. Uh, I don't know whether things are going to change uh, so fast. Uh, we cannot just uh, work from home so easily as the Western world is talking about. Uh, we have much smaller residences. We have three generations working in the family. We don't have the resources. So there's not, it's not going to be easy. I think uh, we are definitely having to go back to offices at some point uh, safely and maybe you know having less people every day and sort of working in that manner. Uh, as architects, how are we going to change things? See, we can't change things unless there's political and bureaucratic will. And unless the politicians of our country and the bureaucrats of our country believe that what has happened now needs to be changed, nothing is really going to happen. We can fight. We know what's happening in several issues. We know what's happening in uh, the Central Vista issue. We know what's happening in Dharavi today, how now they're in a hurry to work on certain solutions, which are not necessarily the best solutions. So my concern is in a way that things will get hurried up and done, uh, which, uh, you know, in the, in the name of uh, COVID and post-COVID, which not necessarily will be the best thing. So how do we architects make the difference? How do we stop being peripheral to society? How do we, we have to hear our voices? I think all of you have to go into politics and fight, fight for the people of our country, because it seems like only the politicians and the bureaucrats uh, have the right uh, and the ability. So maybe go into the bureaucracy. You know, you look at the bureaucracy and politicians, they're full of lawyers. Why is it that apart from Pilu Modi, there's not a single architect who went into any of these things? You ever have? Architects as bureaucrats, you have lawyers, you have doctors, you have doctor politicians, you have lawyer politicians, but we don't go into these activist situations. And until we do that, and this has to fall on you young people, you have to go out into the country, countryside. You have to go and fight for our people. You have to help them and help ourselves come out with the right solutions. But only if we have the authority and the power to do so, can we do so. So I hope all you young people will now make that beginning and not just worry about doing a five-star project or a film star's house or whatever, but rather go and see how you can help the nation, how you can change it with your knowledge of design, urban planning, city planning, rural planning, architecture and all the other aspects to our to our very great profession that we all belong to thank you but, uh, continuing with what you said uh, ma'am don't you think that our government has a major role in supporting architects uh, than how they're doing today um, because hardly architects get any support uh, by government at all so, so that's my exact point. Unless you become the government, you can't support yourself, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's the point. Because who is the government? The government is made up of people, right? Yes. So unless our profession is also represented in the government, we will never have a say. Yes. Yeah. So I hope some of you, we have, you know, we're churning out thousands and thousands of architects every year. Go out and do some of these nation building activities as well. That's what's going to be important. And indirectly, you'll be providing a huge benefit to the profession for the future. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Sorry for the, for the technical glitch earlier. I could not thank architects Brinda and Nandini for sharing their lovely film on making of their book work in continuities really hope the audience will get a copy of the book to learn more about their practice thank you so much architect Brinda and architect Nandini for being so generous with your time uh, for 
also for the great conversation, for the engaging presentation. Um, such an ins inspiring design conversation we've all had today, thanks to you. Really appreciate it. Our thanks to architect Parul from SMK, who also made this conversation possible. Thanks to our moderators, Varsha and Istita, who facilitated an interesting conversation with the architects who I did not have a chance to introduce earlier. I would like to take the opportunity to introduce them. Nishtita is an architect from Bangalore who works as a program coordinator for the built environment team at the Selco Foundation. She graduated with a Bachelor's of Architecture from RB College of Architecture in 2016. Nishtita's interest lies in developing responsible and efficient design solution for grassroots issues. Our second moderator who facilitated the conversation uh, is Varsha Rajmudi, an architect who graduated with a master's degree from the University of Melbourne, where she focused on sustainability integrated, sustainable integrated building designs. She's current, she currently lives and works in Melbourne. Varsha also obtained her bachelor's degree in architecture from RV College in 2015. Thank you very much again for an inspiring conversation, presentation, such a joyous, vibrant one. Thank you, audience, architect, uh, DU and Clayworks team. Have a great evening. See you on Saturday, 10th October for a new in-progress session. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.